Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dave Crouch, and this is Policy Talks. We uh, conduct po policy talks about once a month. It is produced by the Williamson, Inc., our Chamber of Commerce here in Williamson County. So we are partial to the subjects that affect the business community. If you'll notice our agenda, that's uh, where we focus most of the time. We uh, are glad to have a uh, distinguished-looking audience here at Columbia State this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful morning, and the campus is gorgeous. And uh, Dr. Lample, you got it uh, looking like a garden out there. And uh, we we appreciate your uh, hospitality and letting us uh, meet here. Our TV audience is uh, here, courtesy of Creed Henderson and the um, and WCTV, uh, Comcast Channel Three, Tom Lawrence and WAKM get us out on the air on uh, WAKM and. We uh, appreciate that audience joining us as well. Our panelists this morning are our Williamson County Legislative Delegation, minus one. Senator Joy Hensley has a, conf a conflicting event down in his, uh, the lower part of his district. We are the upper part of his district, but uh, he is not able to be with us this morning. But we have with us this morning our Senate Majority Leader and uh, represented our Senate... Golly, State Senator representing uh, District 27, Jack Johnson. Jack, glad to have you here this morning. In order of seniority, and uh, we uh, are not going to enjoy this seniority uh, next year, but uh, Sam Whitson representing the 60, 65th uh, represent, uh, House District. And then uh, Todd Warner representing the 92nd District down in uh, Marshall County in the southern part of Williamson County. Gino Bullzo representing the 61st District, uh, which is the central part of northern Williamson County. And then Jake McCallman, you're pretty much the eastern side of Williamson County, all the way down to Spring Hill, I think. So appreciate you all making time to be with us. Uh, it's uh, always a good discussion here to find out what uh, what's been going on down on Capitol Hill. I understand you adjourned yesterday, so it's all done for 2024. And uh, we uh, look forward to kind of getting a wrap up on that today. Obviously, the uh, Education Freedom Scholarships, uh, sometimes affectionately known as vouchers, were, was the, uh, the main agenda for the governor this time. It did not make it through the the uh, the gauntlet, uh, Jack. You were the governor's uh, uh, lead man on the Senate side, and uh, the the Senate and the House could never get together on what they thought it ought to look like. The governor was uh, a little slow getting the details out this year. Uh, why do you think that was, and and do you think that might have affected whether or not you actually got it through the the system? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back with you. Um, the governor made the announcement for that program back in November of last year. Um, uh, we actually introduced his version of the bill in January. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was out there. It's a, it a fairly simple bill to create 20,000 Freedom Scholarships um, that would allow parents to utilize the appropriation of state dollars that go to educate their child to take that to a private school or home school. Uh, that amount is about seven, just over seven thousand uh, dollars. Very broad support for that, uh, both in the in the House and in the Senate. Um, certainly had the votes in both chambers on the floor to pass some version of school choice. Um, the money is appropriated in the budget is one hundred and forty four million dollars. Uh, enormously popular. Um, the, the distinction was, and, and as you know, anytime I, you want to talk about school choice, I want to talk about everything we've done for public education. Because people try to make the assertion that if you support school choice, you're against public education. And that could not be farther from the truth. Uh, you know, in the last decade, uh, with what we appropriated this year for traditional public schools, we're up to almost $4 billion increase. That's about a 46% increase in funding for traditional public education in the state. I could go on and on about the things we did. We included another $125 million in here for teacher raises. You know, we have a commitment to get the minimum starting salary for public school teachers to 50000 to be more competitive with the state, $50,000 a year to be more competitive. <clears throat> Uh, the House uh, wanted, in uh, in addition to passing the school choice 
legislation that the governor wanted uh, had some other ideas, uh, some good ideas about some further reforms in public education. The Senate was more interested in keeping a cleaner school choice bill, separating those other issues out. Good news is we had a really, really good conversation about it, and the $144 million is still in the budget. We didn't, we're not spending one penny of that money. It will be there next year. Um, and when you're talking about a program like this, the funding is often the most difficult part. Well, we accomplished that, and the House and the Senate were in broad agreement on making sure that that money is appropriated there. We're committed to school choice in the state of Tennessee. Uh, Alabama just passed school choice. Arkansas just passed school choice. I think there's maybe six or eight other states that are out there that are, that are contemplating it, in addition to the dozen or so states that have already passed it. So yes, we will get it done. We'll reintroduce it in, in January. There was no animosity between the House and the Senate over they had some really good ideas, we had some good ideas. We're a bicameral legislature, and the House and the Senate have to agree, and we couldn't quite get there uh, by the time we got ready to adjourn. That's another issue that we have in Tennessee is that we are a part-time legislature. We're not there year-round like they are in Congress, and I'm really glad about that. And you all should be really glad about that. <laughs> so so we, have a, we have a finite period of time during which we have to resolve these problems. And when we can't, we'll carry it over to the next year, and we'll get it done then. So the governor's fully committed to that. Uh, he stated so. We had our leadership uh, press conference with the governor last night after we adjourned, and, and he was asked about it. And he's fully committed to bringing it back next year, and I am too. A couple of years ago, you passed a, a, a bill that included only uh, Davidson and Shelby counties. And it came back, I think, last year and added uh, Hamilton County to that. And that rolling out one county at a time that was receptive to having those was working pretty good. Would that not be a better way to roll it out in the future just as to specific counties that are not meeting education goals? Well, that was a good program, and we did pass that in 2019, the governor's very first year in office. And you're right, it, it started with Davidson and Shelby counties, and then uh, Hamilton County was added in. That's an education savings account program, and there is a difference uh, between what we're proposing here with education freedom scholarships. Uh, but, but the thing is, there are parents outside of Davidson, Shelby, and Hamilton counties who think there's a better option for their kid. Uh, in terms of their education. And so we shouldn't limit it just to those counties. Granted, Davidson and Shelby County have, according to the Department of Education, the highest number and the highest concentration of failing schools. That, that is true. But if you believe in school choice, if you believe in empowering parents, it shouldn't be limited to just three counties. It should be available to all Tennesseans. Todd Warner, you took a lot of heat for your position on this. And... Uh, uh, you were not on the same uh, agenda as Jack is on. The um, And correct me if I'm wrong, but this appeared to be another one of the issues that we see over the years between the rural counties and the urban-suburban counties, where the urban-suburban counties were seemed to be more receptive to this uh, in some ways. The rural counties were... Uh, and I may, be, I may have this all wrong. I, I may put two and two together and get ten. But uh, it, did that enter into that? Is, your county, uh, Marshall County, is a fairly rural county. Well, well, thank you, Dave. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to, to represent part of Williamson County. Uh, you're, you're exactly correct. Uh, and you've heard me say this before, but four years ago when I ran the first time, there was not a – private school in my district. I represented all of Marshall, parts of uh, South and West Lincoln, down to Ardmore, across the Alabama line, catching uh, Southern Franklin County and Southern Marion County. And it was the number one thing that I heard. The previous rep down there had promised those people that he would not support uh, the voucher program. And uh, it's a promise I made to our, to our public schools, and it's a promise I'm going to keep. Uh, one thing I did hear that you hit on, there was a lot of rural Republicans in the House that thanked me so much behind the scenes for taking a stand and, and, and fighting against it because they did not want to be put in the position to have to vote on that. Uh, in a in a in a primary year, there's a lot of a lot of rural Tennessee that don't have private schools. I won't give you an example where this comes into play down in, in on the south end of Marshall County. Let's take Cornersville, very rural, small town down there. Uh, they might not have a 14, 15 students in a class. Let's say four or five of those students leave. 
they'd have to drive 45 minutes to an hour to get to the nearest private school, first thing that, would, that they would have to do. Number two, it, it, say they're in an accelerated math or English class. Say four of those students leave, at least 12, 12 students, 11 students in that class. Then it becomes a choice of the preach, I mean, of the uh, principal or the school superintendent. Is it viable? Does it make sense for us to put this this class or have this accelerated class to pay that teacher to go down there and teach just 12 students? So that's the kind of problems you run into across, you know, rural Tennessee where there's no private schools, where there's small schools. When you start taking a few students away, it, it, it starts to create problems, uh, you know, for those class whether they can justify paying that teacher or not. And again, to the House and, and the Senate version, I respect uh, uh, Senator Johnson here. There were two different bills. Uh, the House is what I call a pork style Washington bill. Uh, you know, we usually don't do that here in Tennessee. Let's, let's, let's break out everything on its own bill and let it stand on its own merit. And uh, I think it would have, they would have stood a better chance maybe, it, it, you know, in the House had they done that. Uh, not 100% sure, but I'm not sure they ever had the votes in the House to get it. I feel like if we had had the votes in the House, uh, the bill might have might have moved forward over there. Now, one of the publications that I read pointed out that uh, in over half the counties in Tennessee, the public school system is the largest employer, and of course, that means a lot of votes. <laughs> Absolutely, and that was the case when I, when I told you four years ago when I when I first ran. Uh, they are the, the school system was the, the largest employer. And let me tell you, folks, and y'all know this: teachers vote, <laughs> and their families vote. So, uh, and and the rural Republicans, they know that they do. Well, Bolzo, tell us about uh, your reflections on the voucher uh, legislation effort and uh, where you came down on it. Well, good morning, Dave. I was in favor of it. I think that it dovetails nicely with our education funding formula, this thing we call TISA, which applies a capitation rate to each child so that the money follows the child. And when you have an education formula like that, uh, it just actually lends itself to empowering parents to take the amount that the state is allocating per child and deciding whether it's in the child's best interest to go to the local public school, go to a charter school, go to a private school, go to a hybrid school, or somehow use that money in some type of a, a homeschooling system. And so I think we had a nice robust debate this year, and I think we did advance the ball. And you know, the program that the governor laid out was gonna be implemented in stages anyway. Leader Johnson mentioned 20,000 scholarships. It was gonna be 10,000 the first year, 10,000 the second year, then it was going to become universal. So my hope is that when we go back, you know, we'll just go back in perhaps at the second tier with the 20,000 scholarships and then ultimately move to universal education freedom scholarships because ultimately, to me, the best way of approaching education is to give the control to the parents as to where the child goes. And the governor's bill does that. We didn't quite get across the finish line this year, but I think we did advance the ball beyond the 50-yard line, especially with regard to the funding, which is now in the budget. So when we come back next year, I think we'll probably be able to get that ball across the goal line, and I think it's going to be ultimately in the best interest of everyone in the education system, the parents, the students, public schools, private schools, charter schools, the whole panoply. Gotten it in field goal, field goal range this year? Uh, probably so for a, a good NFL kicker. <laughs> good, Jake. You, uh, I think you supported the the bill. Tell us uh, what uh, what you think, how your constituents feel about it, where you think it'll go next year. Uh, and good morning, Dave, and glad to be here as always. And I've said this numerous times. I campaigned on school choice. I've been a firm believer in school choice. Um, I. To echo Leader Johnson's comments, I don't believe that you have to be either pro school choice and anti public schools. I think you can support both. Um, I think we had a good bill in in the House, and I, I think the governor's plan was uh, was solid. Uh, to echo off of uh, Rep. Also, right here, uh, we did make some positive motion and positive uh, positive gains towards getting a school choice bill passed. Um, 
uh, the House bill was really a total education reform from public schools and uh, I mean, there were numerous things with regards to maintenance and teacher raises and insurance benefits and everything else that would have helped uh, helped teachers and helped our, our school systems across the state um, while still empowering parents to have school choice to determine how they want the tax, di tax dollars allocated to their kids to be used with, uh, with their education choices. So me as a, as a parent here in Williamson County, and I've said this numerous times as well, had we had school <clears throat> excuse me had we had school choice in place my choice as a parent would have been to keep my kids in page high and in williamson county schools because we have outstanding public schools in williamson county so that would have been my choice to have my tax dollars stay right there in williamson county so look forward to being able to vote in support of the bill next year Tim wilson you uh beg to disagree and uh <laughs> You're sitting on it, Sam. <laughs> Dave, thanks for that question. Nobody's asked me to do anything or, or my opinion since I announced <laughs> I was retired. You're, you're re retired, and uh, so I guess they put you out to pasture. But uh, yeah, Can I correct that real quick? He is still the state representative until November, so he is still on the job. That's and right. I'm still you're your state the, representative. You sure are. You're and my I got, senator. And forever. I got a lot to complain about, so I got your cell number. <laughs> I hope it's not a pothole, <laughs> please. I hear so many. That, that's my job. So. We, we fixed that the other day with that asphalt truck on McEwen. <laughs> Jake and I were going to take a shovel out there, weren't we? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you opposed the bill. Uh, our, our school board here in the county uh, voted against it, although not unanimously. Uh, the Franklin Special School Board did vote, I think, against it unanimously. So you leaned... Uh, t toward their uh, their feelings. Tell us why. Hey, well, again, good morning, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all my friends here. This will be my last policy talk. Okay. Oh. okay. Oh, no, I'm next month, too. Ain't okay, never mind. So, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get a microphone. But it, uh, We're going to get him back and just... No, listen, uh, you know, I've been consistent on that. Uh, you know, a lot of times I tell my friends, I'm not voting against your bill. I'm voting for my district, okay? And I had issues from the beginning with the funding, uh, how it could bleed out a public school and they still have responsibilities for children uh, with disabilities, for transportation, running a facility, uh, special uh, uh, enhanced teaching requirements. Um, and again, I think it's more of a suburban versus rural issue. And, and I think if they do an after action report of how this thing went down, I think the missteps really involved um, you know, kind of the point person in the House side had some issues and created some problems for the legislation going forward. There was an organization that uh, uh, AFP, Americans for Prosperity, they attacked members as they were trying to negotiate how they were going to do that. And I've learned up there, if, and I'm going to be a little political here for the first time in eight years, but if you want to kill a bill, make sure AFP is against you because they have had a poor track record up there and their leadership needs to be uh, a little more careful how they go after my fellow members on the Republican side. And also, uh, the governor had a really good guy out of his administration as his point man, Bill Dunn, one of the most respected, one of my best friends up there. I think Bill did his best on this uh, to work with members, but... Um, Again, one of my problems with this legislation was, is the funding for public schools and the importance of public schools to the community. You see that on a football night at Page High School. But also, what are you going to do when there's a school? And I'll use the example. Let's say the Branch Davidians, like they had in Waco, Texas, decided to open a pub, uh, their private school. How, how is the public going to respond to that? How are we as a group of legislators worry about our public funds going to groups that we think may be on the extremist side and may be harmful to children? We could not answer that question. And uh, so that was my concern from the very beginning. I think the, the governor really does care about our education system. I think people who are on both sides of this issue care about the kids in our public schools and our private schools. Uh, there's no animosity, but I just think there should have been a better job explaining this from the beginning and also to make sure there was no negative impact on our communities and our public schools. Got the mic, Sam, so we're going to change change gears here just a minute. 
but uh, you all voted to allow teachers to carry weapons, uh, concealed weapons, in in the schools. And uh, uh, hang on, Todd. The <laughs> Sam, you're a you're a uh, lieutenant colonel. Is that full colonel? Full colonel. I, I I wasn't in the military, so I can't keep all these uh, titles straight. Showed the Army had a sense of humor, according to my boss. <laughs> You've had a little experience with guns, though, and uh, are you not comfortable with teachers having guns in the classrooms? Well, again, this is a rural versus uh, urban and suburban issue. I think there's some uh, schools out there in our rural communities that are short 500 SROs, and I think the intent was to make sure there was a system in, uh, in place for the protection of the kids. I think the intent was was good. Um, the the issue I had is, um, and the bill changed over the years. They put so many more guardrails on this. I doubt you will get 20 people statewide that were qualified to do this uh, after all said and done. But my concern from my experience of carrying weapons for 26 years and training soldiers how to use them uh, had to do with the security of the weapon. Because I can tell you, no many, so many times I found weapons unsecured. And I also, I remember as a lieutenant, uh, arms room called me, he said, sir, we're getting ready to close down. Where's your pistol? And it was back on in my desk, okay? So uh, I can admit that now, statute of limitations, you know, it's, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's 1977, okay? So, but anyway. Um, so I just, just my familiarity. And also, the, th the thing is, there is a 40 a 40 hour a year annual training requirement, but the school system uh, would not fund the, the ammo and the weapons to do this. And that is something that is fundamental, that you have to know what you're doing to use that weapon and, and to be proficient with it. But also I learned in the military too, not everybody runs to the sound of gunfire when there's danger, okay? So um, I just had concerns with it and I wanted to reflect my school's uh, district and their wishes. Uh, we can't spend 20 minutes on every issue, but if you've got significant input, go Here, ahead. Let me, I'll, 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 I'll bat second and let Todd do the cleanup. And uh, let me advance some of the points that Sam was just making. You know, typically a piece of legislation is designed to solve a problem. And what was the problem here? Well, the problem here is that although the funding is available, we had schools in our rural communities that could not find SROs to protect the kids at school. And Sam is right. There are 500 openings right now. And so the question is, what do you do about that? And ultimately, the answer was what came to be HB 1202, uh, that we would allow locals under certain circumstances to take properly trained, properly qualified faculty or staff and enlist them to enhance the security of the school. And it's certainly, this is probably one of the most misrepresented and mischaracterized bills of our entire session, because the General Assembly did not arm anyone. The General Assembly did not put a gun in any teacher's hand or in any school. What the bill did was this, and watch this closely, Dave. In order for any teacher to be qualified to bring a firearm into a school first, you had to have the local law enforcement chief agree. You had to have the local superintendent agree. You had to have the local principal of that very school agree. So you had ultimate local control. This is not the state general assembly deciding who brings a gun into school. This is your local sheriff, your local superintendent, and your local principal. And if all three of those agree, and only until all three of those agree, and someone goes through the proper training, through the proper credentialing, the proper mental health evaluation, will they be permitted to assist in the defense of the school? And from my view, it made a lot of sense because the choice is this. Do you leave the schools in the rural districts unprotected? Or do you allow them to protect themselves if the locals think it's best? Because think about how quickly this happens. Take Parkland, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High in 2018. That, that killer killed 17 and wounded 17 in the first three minutes and 45 seconds. Take Robb Elementary at Uvalde in 2022. 
that deranged individual got off 100 rounds of ammunition in the first 99 seconds. So you need an on-site armed response to protect the school. The police can get there, but it's after time. And Covenant, as we all saw, it took 14 minutes for the police to get there. And unfortunately, we'd already lost six individuals, three children and three staff members. And I'll also point out that my Democratic colleagues, they make arguments that just contradict themselves. They're always trying to use Covenant and, and the Covenant moms in, in their defense. Well, Covenant, a private school, elected to arm their faculty. Okay, we were called insane if we voted for this bill. Well, are the Democrats calling the covenant parents and the covenant administration insane? I certainly hope not, but that's the implication of their argument. Because last Friday, I had a covenant mom in my office who, frankly, was in support of 1202 and who was happy that her school did what they could to protect students. So I was in favor of it, Dave. I, uh, I can't clean up after that. Gino explained, explained it real well. I mean, uh, he, he done a job, a uh, fantastic job explaining the bill. And that was my point was we didn't, we didn't, we didn't arm teachers. We gave the locals the ability to, to make that choice. And that was my point. Thank you, Gino. What, job well done, as usual. Yeah. Uh, version, uh, I mean, well, they ended up being the same version, but uh, Senate pretty happy the way it turned out. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's it's a, the most common sense piece of legislation, and, and these guys did a great job. One thing I will add, I use this example, and, and this is a real example. You've got a rural school district in West Tennessee. I won't call the county. At times, they have three sheriff's deputies patrolling that entire county, and, and they cannot hire anyone, even though we've provided the money to be an SRO in that school. And their kids are sitting there vulnerable. Now, we're sitting here in Williamson County with an amazing sheriff's department, with amazing city police departments, a county commission who put school resource officers in every one of our schools long before the state ever provided the money to do it. We are blessed here in Williamson County. But when I have someone from Williamson County uh, rise up and say, I think this is a bad idea and you shouldn't do this, and you're neglecting the ability of this school district out in West Tennessee to provide some degree of protection for their kids, when we make decisions, we look first at how does it impact our district. Sam said it very well. That's the first thing I think about. How does this impact my, my constituents here? This bill's not going to affect Williams County. I really don't think our school board or our school system is going to even think about this because they don't need to. Yet there are people in Williamson County who think that we're going to go to Mrs. Jones, a 63-year-old English teacher who's never held a weapon, and put a 45 Glock in her desk drawer and say, here, use this if something happens. They literally believe that. People literally think that that's what's going to happen. No, but in that rural district I was telling you about in West Tennessee, they have two different uh, either teachers or coaches or something that are former law enforcement. They have 20 year careers in law enforcement and now they, they teach. Why would you not empower them to utilize the skill set of these people that are in their schools to protect those kids. That's what the bill does and makes a lot of sense. That's the uh, beauty of policy talks. Is folks, you get the backstory on all this stuff and uh, you learn a lot. So, uh, Sam? And, and I, I'm not disagreeing with Jack, but what I'm concerned with though is some of these districts may decide in the future arming the teachers is a cheaper alternative than SROs. Point taken. Um, we're going to skip over the next two uh, items on my list, and uh, I hope you folks will stick around after the show and uh, quiz these guys about it. But the fourth grade reading retention rules were softened up a little bit and given a little more local control than the arbitrary rules that were put in a couple of years ago. The bill to ban political flags in schools didn't make it through the through the gauntlet again, but. Uh, uh, Representative Warner and Representative Bulzo are, are experts on that subject, and if you've got any questions about that, I'm sure they'll be able to uh, explain that to you. I want to get on to the budget and the uh, franchise and excise tax uh, issues, and uh, if we have time, we'll come back to those. But uh, uh, $52.8 billion budget with a B. Uh, that's, I think, a new record, and uh, we... Uh, as Jack pointed out, uh, I think $261 million 
in new money for public schools, school funding f formulas. Um, another 100 million in the rainy day fund that in my opinion ought to be put into potholes and uh, instead, but uh, 60 million into uh, the state park improvements. And then 1.5 billion going into the uh, refunds of franchise and excise taxes. And I have read the web pages of one of the biggest uh, accounting firms in the country here talking about it. Uh, I've read the, the web page from Baker Donaldson, who I think was the law firm that kind of raised this issue originally. And I still don't understand it, okay? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, as the franchise tax originally was uh, set up, a, a company, corporate, a corporation, um, uh, limited partnership or limited uh, LLC, limited liability corporation, they had two choices on how they could calculate their F&E tax. Uh, 25 basis points or one quarter of a percent on their whatever a portion net worth is. You can explain that in a minute. Or the book value of their real and tangible personal property owned or used in Tennessee. That second part is apparently what was ruled uh, or suspected to be unconstitutional. Now, why would it be unconstitutional for Tennessee to tax the real estate and personal property in the state of Tennessee that those companies own. Representative Bulzo, you're the constitutional lawyer here, so. Sure, I, I can explain what the argument is, Dave. I can't say that I agree with it. But the argument is that under our tax structure, the franchise tax was calculated to be the greater of 25 basis points of a portion net worth or the book value of tangible personal property and real property owned or used in Tennessee. And the idea was that if, if every state had that same structure, it would actually tax interstate revenues higher than intrastate revenues. And therefore, according to some, the structure of our tax violated what's called the internal consistency rule of the Supreme Court's test to determine whether there's discrimination under the Commerce Clause, the dormant aspect of the Commerce Clause. So that it, this is something that really does take a little bit of le legal training to get into. But the idea is that our tax discriminated somehow against interstate commerce. I studied it. I never agreed with it. That's why I voted against this bill. I just I never got to the point where I agreed that our tax, which has been on the books for 100 years, violated this very specific rule of the Dormant Commerce Clause. And this, this internal consistency rule is an unwritten rule tacked onto an unwritten part of the Constitution because Justice Clarence Thomas doesn't even believe there is such a thing as a Dormant Commerce Clause. And in the Maryland case that got this whole thing started in 2015, it was only a 5-4 Supreme Court decision striking down Maryland's tax, which truly was a discriminatory tax. And since that decision, four of those justices have been replaced, three with the Trump judges, who I think would be more likely to align themselves with Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas, who dissented in the Maryland case. So in my view, if this issue ever was attacked in Tennessee, ultimately we would prevail. And I would rather fight than pay the $1.5 billion. And that's why I voted against it. Now, what is a portion net worth? It, it has to do with the, uh, you take the entire net worth of a, of a company and you determine what portion of that net worth is allocable to revenues generated in the state of Tennessee versus revenues generated in the other states in the country. And then they pay 25 basis points on that part of their net worth. I suspect you might have a different opinion, but uh, do you think that was, the, I mean, obviously you think it was the right thing to do. You voted for it, right? I, I did. I did vote for it. And Gino makes a, and, and this conversation, Gino did such a good job of explaining the, the, the legality of the issue that, that we were dealing with. Um, I'm all, I, I'm, I felt good about cutting the taxes prospectively, cutting the tax and, and removing this, this property tax component. That makes us more consistent with the states around us. 
Our chamber folks, our economic community development folks will tell you that when they're recruiting companies to come to Tennessee, one of the issues they have to overcome is that we have this tax. And <clears throat> um, so I thought it was a good idea to, to fix it. I uh, didn't really like the circumstances through which we felt compelled to take it up and address it, but that is what it is. And so cutting the tax prospectively, it's the largest tax cut in the history of the state of Tennessee, will affect about 100,000 businesses. 80% um, of those are Tennessee domicile companies, and it's gonna make us more competitive economically. So I, I feel good about cutting the tax. We can afford it. It's $393 million recurring in, on a prospective basis. It's a totally different conversation about the three-year look back, which I ended up supporting the governor's uh, proposal. Uh, because it, 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 under current law, there is a three-year statute of limitations if someone has been taxed incorrectly or if they've been overtaxed, they can go back three years and take a look at it. So it was the p position of the Attorney General and the, the, the attorneys at the Department of Revenue that in order to put us in the most defensible position moving forward is to set aside the money to allow those companies to apply for a refund for the, for the last three years. And that's what we ended up passing. But it was not without very, vigorous discussion and debate, and I respect people who have opinions on, on both sides. In fact, the original version of the, 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 that came through the House only did a one-year look back. And, and so that was part of the conversation as well. So, but we ended up uh, uh, passing it, and so it's good news for Tennessee taxpayers. Um, you have, uh, beginning May 15th, if you're an, uh, a business entity that pays this tax, uh, beginning May 15th, you can apply uh, for a refund for the last three years, you have until November 15th in order to get that done, uh, to get that application in, and then, of course, the department will process those. So we set aside $1.55 billion for the three-year look back. We budgeted the $400 million prospectively moving forward. Um, there's no guarantee that uh, all of that $1.5 billion, by the way, will necessarily be applied for and collected. Uh, we set aside what we believe is the worst case scenario if every company that is eligible for that three-year look back refund applies, then we've got the money set aside. A lot of these entities have gone bankrupt or shut down or moved out of state. You know, th there will be a lot that don't even apply for it. Keep it a secret. <laughs> well, we're going to notify, uh, the Department of Revenue will notify everyone that they have on the rolls that, that they believe might be eligible for this. They'll have six months to apply for it. And, uh, and if there is any of that $1.55 billion left at the, after all the refunds are processed and paid, obviously that money will revert back to the general fund. We'll get a look next year at who actually got these refunds. Uh, I understand for 30 days. Uh, yeah, very quickly, uh, that's, that's something we also negotiated with the House. Uh, uh, if you apply um, on, uh, from, on May 31st, the Department of Revenue will publish on their website a list of the companies that applied for and received the refund. It will be, be broken down into ranges in terms of the amount of, of refund that you received. Um, that was something that uh, personally I was not crazy about. I don't think we should be doing that, but it was important to, to other members, and so we included that in the legislation. And if I could, Dave, I mean, Jack is right. Not all $1.5 billion is going to be spent. I can guarantee you the part that my law firm paid in and franchise and excise tax, we are not seeking a rebate for, and I would encourage every other business in Williamson County not to file a, a request for a rebate. That tax is constitutional. It's not oppressive. It's only a quarter of 1% of, of, of the net revenue. So, uh, I think Jack is right. It's not all going to be spent, and I hope as much stays there as, as, as we can possibly uh, work out. Yeah, I mean, just from my perspective, at the end of the day, it's a, a tax on a business is a tax on all of us. I mean, those are passed down. So anytime we can cut a tax, it's going to benefit Tennessee. It's going to benefit every Tennessean. So I was uh, proud to support that and vote for it. That was, of course, the, uh, the high spot of the, the budget. Uh, any, any other thing in the budget, Jack, that you want to? Uh, well, you touched on, on, on big ones. We, uh, we uh, continue to put money into our rainy day fund. Uh, that's important to keep us uh, you know, protected in, into the future. The budget is balanced. Uh, another important component, as we have done repeatedly year after year, we have $810 million in recurring surplus that we're not recognizing. We're spending that on one-time uh, one expenses, uh, but we're not 
allocating it to anything on a recurring basis. So if absolutely nothing changed, when we come back in January to contemplate the 25-26 fiscal year budget, we've got an $810 million surplus. So that's, that's good conservative governance there. Uh, we've got surpluses, but we're not recognizing them. Another uh, issue that could have affected, uh, in particular, Williamson Medical Center here in Williamson County is the hospital certificate of need legislation that uh, was proposed. I think uh, there's a, a rift between the nonprofit hospitals similar to Williamson Medical versus the profit hospitals like HCA and uh, community health care uh, because the, the for-profit hospitals would like to move in to some of the more profitable areas that uh, the nonprofits have a a fairly good foothold in. Uh, Jack, you saw some of this coming, I think, uh, two or three months ago, and I think helped uh, divert some of the uh, damage that could have been done. What, uh, what does this, number one, does this affect Williamson Medical the way it came through the legislative process? And uh, Will HCA now be able to build a hospital in, in Spring Hill? Well, what, what you're referring to is the certificate of need process, and that's something that we've had in Tennessee for many, many years uh, relative to health care. Um, to build a new hospital, you have to apply and demonstrate that there's a need that's not being met in that community, and, and that is going away. That is going to go away, and I support it going away. Um, health care is not traditional free market. We know that if you're in healthcare, you, you know that yeah, the, 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 the consumer doesn't determine what they're paying and they don't pay most of it because they have insurance that's negotiating the rates. We could get into a whole philosophical conversation about that. But there, there is a movement in Tennessee to, over time, to eliminate that certificate of need process and go to more of a licensure type of process. Um, and that is going to happen. And I've been very clear with my, all my friends that are in healthcare here in, in Williams County. That I think the discussion is about how that will happen and the timing of that happening. And what you've seen in Tennessee incrementally over the last several years is we have chipped away at certain elements of the certificate of need process. And for example, uh, and I think I have this right, and you all correct me if, if I'm wrong. If, if, you're, if it's a distressed uh, uh, county in Tennessee, you don't have to go through the certificate of need to build a hospital, okay? Because we know we have a lack of health care in, in rural uh, parts of Tennessee. Now, no one's done that because it's not economically viable, but that's just an example of something we've done. We've done other things relative to imaging and, and different things. A key part of this legislation that did happen this year uh, is relative to freestanding uh, emergency rooms or emergency departments. And... Uh, and I'm drawing a blank. I've, I've got my book here, but I just got it about nine o'clock last night. So I haven't, uh, it, all the details are in here. Uh, I think is it within a certain number of miles now of an acute care hospital, um, if you're beyond that, you don't have to get a certificate of need now to build a freestanding uh, emergency facility. Jack, I think it's 30 miles, if I'm not mistaken. Is it 30? Okay. Um, don't quote me on that. Now, there was some discussion about doing away with um, uh, the certificate of need for full-fledged acute care hospitals, and that could have been problematic for, for Williamson County. I do think that is ultimately going to happen at some point down the road, but again, there needs to be a runway and a time period so that we have Williamson Health here in Williamson County, which is an amazing um, medical uh, entity with the hospital and, and all the great work that they do here in, in Williamson County. And obviously there are concerns about someone else coming in and, and building a hospital. Um, but that is not included in the legislation right now. The freestanding emergency rooms are. Um, and I think that ultimately, I can't tell you when, but over the next certain number of years, we are going to phase out the certificate of need process in Tennessee and go to more of a licensure-based type of program similar to some other states. Just from my perspective of the business I'm in, uh, the momentum that appears in the healthcare industry is to get away from acute care hospitals, period. And uh, the, um, the United Healthcare's of the world and the Elevance Healthcare's and the Humana's are all getting their own surgery centers and dialysis centers and taking away the more profitable areas of healthcare from the, the traditional uh, hospitals. So 
things are changing, but uh, I just was curious how this law was going to um, evolve here locally. Again, Mr. Bolzo, the uh, state books that we now have, a uh, result of some of your efforts, we now uh, have the Atkin Bible as an official Bible of the state of Tennessee, um, Roots uh, by Alex Haley, uh, Washington's Farewell Address, Dolly Parton's Coat of Many Colors, and I don't know, various other, a uh, few other books. How did we settle on these particular books? And what is the Atkin Bible, by the way? The uh, Aiken Bible is also known as the Bible of the American Revolution. It was printed um, by a fellow named James Aiken in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1782 uh, with the authorization of Congress because uh, prior to the American Revolutionary War, all the Bibles that we have had in the country came from the British. And obviously there weren't any coming over uh, during the Revolutionary War, so there was a shortage of, of Bibles um, after the Revolutionary War. And this Aiken Bible is unique in that it was the only Bible that Congress ever authorized to be printed. And we have three of the five originals remaining in the world right here in Tennessee. So it's got some Tennessee roots and it's got some historical roots. Um, well, it's, uh, that's a good question. I, I think at least one of them is here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, I think the, there may be as many as, as two perhaps in Middle Tennessee and one somewhere else, but the American Bible Project could answer that question better than I could. But that's, that's the significance of that particular Bible. Uh, I thought it was an interesting mix of, of books, uh, and uh, we've got a lot of state things uh, now, and uh, those were an interesting mix. Uh, I'm going to touch on potholes one more time. Uh, I didn't see any efforts in the budget uh, to add any money to the highway funds, to add any money to transportation in general. Uh, when are we going to do that, guys? What's the... This is Dave Crouch's moment here. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to our uh, chairman of the subcommittee of transportation. Yes, sir. Well, one of the best pieces of legislation was last year, actually. The governor fund, uh, funded the, uh, the Improve Act, the modernization, and I think that thing is moving forward. You know, I think our budget was $10 billion less this year. We, the revenue... And, and yeah, Sam, thank you. I, I meant to correct Dave on that. We're, our budget is 16% less than it was last year. It's a 16% reduction, largely due to some of the, the, the federal money that was coming in. Uh, but, but yes, 16% less. So. And correct. And again, it goes back. And uh, correct. What's that? And corrected. Okay. So, but again, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. The highway trust fund is broke. We have not increased the uh, gas tax since, what, 1986. And if you want to drive on the road, you got to pay for that road. And until we have the political courage in Washington to fix that problem, you're going to continue to see deterioration of our highways. Sam, you've uh, been a good partner to the business community. Uh, the chamber has uh, appreciated your um, your ear when uh, there was a, a, a business, business uh, issue that comes up. Uh, if you got any advice for your uh, surviving delegation here that's uh, going to be here working with us in the future. Uh, well, thank you, Dave. And I enjoyed working with all these folks. And I, got, I forgot to mention one great series of books is Shelby Foote's uh, Civil War series that uh, Gino added. I read that as a young Army officer, and it's a great, great uh, piece of history for our country. Um, listen, um, a lot of things, you know, we talk about bills we pass, but also we're on defense a lot. I get calls from our mayors uh, and our school system and say this bill will impact our county and, this, and the person carrying it may live in Cock County and has no impact on him, but he's read something that wants to impact um, our county. And that's a lot of times people don't see that. You're up there fighting and you try to build a coalition uh, uh, within your caucus and across the aisle to make sure you can protect your district and your county from these people who have great ideas, that have no idea that Williamson County, I really do believe, is the economic engine of Tennessee. And the reason, and our connection to Nashville is very important. We got to keep that in mind because if we weren't next door to Davidson County, we, we would be like 
some county, Hancock County or Hawkins County, would that have and have serious issues um, that they have to deal with up there routinely. But my advice is work closely with the mayors, work closely with the elected local elected officials, your county commissioners, your school board members, your aldermen, because they have a perspective at the ground level that often gets lost at the state level. And a lot of times, we, we do not like Washington telling Tennessee how to do business. And I've always felt that we sometimes go overboard and tell the counties and our local governments how to do their business. I hear Dr. Ken Moore. <laughs> you, uh... Mike's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> you were very close to it, so... You, uh, same question for you. What, uh, what would you like to see in our delegation uh, going forward? Anything in particular? Well, uh, you know, you've mentioned a lot of important subjects this morning. Uh, my mailbox is full of concerns about transportation. And all these things that you've mentioned, I don't think I've had one email about it or one call or one conversation. Uh, the transportation issues is the number one issue to the citizens of our city and I think probably in the county also. Uh, I was very active as chair of the Mayor's Caucus in working on the Improve Act with Commissioner Ely. Uh, it is a start to fix some of our transportation problems, but it's, it's more like a Band-Aid. You know, we've identified projects will be completed within 10 years. Uh, we've identified uh, choice lanes. Uh, so on and so forth. But I think it's time to figure out a new way to fund transportation in Tennessee. We're continually behind. You know, our city is paying for fixed state roads, Franklin Road. How much state money went in that? I don't think any. All of that was city money. So I would urge the delegation to look hard at what some other options may be. Uh, as far as funding transportation in the future. And tr when I say transportation, I'm talking of not only roads, but sidewalks and other uh, modes of transportation. He knew you were going to ask him a question. Our, our, uh, our uh, gentleman that's here, often to uh, represent Middle Tennessee Electric, and I wanted to get an update on the broadband installations that they're doing. But they don't have to wait. So um, we got a little more time. I've, if there's a question in the audience, I would uh, entertain that. Mr. Driggers, introduce yourself. Uh, Dr. Driggers, I uh, live in Spring Hill, uh, running for the school board. I had 25 years in the Army, 25 years at the university, and I'm cursed with an engineer's brain because I started out combat engineer in the infantry, then airborne with explosives and things. And the questions I have for the gun legislation is there's not a whole lot of thought into the specifics. If each county is going to set its own SOP, you need standard weapons, you need standard bullets, you know, uh, <laughs> more training, you need psychological examinations. Shooting somebody really changes you for the rest of your life. And most people, unless they're trained, will freeze. You know, they say you run, you fight. Most people freeze in a crisis. So, and who's going to do the liability insurance so when the teacher stops the shooter, but the bullet hits two or three other kids in the classroom, Where's the liability insurance? So I just, I just think there should be more thought into the specifics of pulling that trigger. That's all. Dennis, let me give you, let me give you two quick thoughts, and then I'll let, let the others jump in. Obviously, one, uh, the whole purpose of our policies is to prevent bullets from flying around kids. Anytime you have bullets flying around kids, you have had a catastrophic failure of public safety. And the bill that was passed uh, this week. Uh, 1202 is really there for deterrence purposes. We want to make sure that all the kids are protected, that these are not gun-free zones, and that would-be shooters know that they are not gun-free zones, which acts as a deterrent. You, schools can actually place a sign that don't have SROs, that our faculty or staff may be armed. So the whole concept is not to 
really engage an active shooter, but to create a deterrent so that no shooter will show up at any of our schools because we don't want bullets flying around kids. And then secondly, recall also that what we did this year was to give public schools, particularly those in rural areas, the same flexibility that our private schools across the state have. Because for many years, our private schools K through 12 have the authority and the ability to develop their own firearms policies. Well now, our local rural schools uh, do as well. And we have not had the kind of problems that your question anticipates in any of the private schools across the country. We had obviously the tragic shooting at Covenant, but that didn't really have anything to do with an armed faculty or staff member because the armed faculty member was on vacation that particular day. So those are my two quick thoughts. I'll chime in too. With the, the bill that was passed, there is a psychological evaluation that is a part of the requirement there. Um, and again, it, this, is an, this is entirely permissive, but to, to Gino's point, yes, it is to serve as a deterrent that if you're going to walk up to our school, you're not going in, uh, you're not walking into fish in a barrel, essentially. And anytime you see these, these atrocities happen, it is in unprotected, unsecure areas. So, uh, but back to your point, yes, there is a psychological component that is incorporated into this bill. Question over here. Stand up and introduce yourself. I'm Angela Frederick. I'm the president of the Williamson County Education Association, so I'm here representing teachers. I actually have a question about a different piece of legislation that the governor signed on Wednesday, House Bill 843, that would take uh, books that depict excessive violence, um, sadomasochistic abuse, depictions of nudity off of the shelves in K-12 libraries and classrooms. And I believe you all voted for it. I haven't had a chance to check the voting rolls on that. So by that, those definitions, it sounds like this official Tennessee state books don't even qualify to be on the shelves in our library anymore. The Bible, the Civil War book, which has excessive violence, uh, Roots by Alex Haley, which also has violence. So I just wondered what you all have to say um, in response to that. Thank you. Gentlemen, don't all speak at once. I'll be happy to speak, but I want to hog the microphone. I mean, to me, it all comes back to empowering parents. And that was the genesis of the Age Appropriate Materials Act of 2022 that Leader Johnson and the General Assembly passed. And we do have a problem with obscenity in our school libraries. And that act was designed to address that. And that act empowered parents to review books that are in the school libraries and raise objections to local school officials should they object. It also required schools to go through a, a process, adopt a written policy to develop school libraries and to review them periodically. And um, as time goes on, I think over time, we're going to see more parents becoming more involved in what their kids are actually reading in schools, and that's a good thing. And I think the more legislation we can pass that empowers parents to become involved in what their kids are exposed to at schools, the better. Not out of time, gentlemen. Uh, really appreciate the time y'all take to be with us every, every time we're here. Uh, some of the busiest people I know, Jack Johnson lives next door to me. His truck is never home. And, <laughs> and I told Deanna a couple of weeks ago, I said, I'm worried about Jack. She said, why? She said, I said, he's working too hard. And uh, I honestly believe that, Jack. You need to slow down a little bit. But maybe you can now. But uh, th these are some of the hardest working uh, men that, uh, that I know. And you're very generous to take your time to be with us here. We enjoy being able to find out some of the thought behind some of these bills and, 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 and the details there because sometimes uh, the press, uh, as hard as they try, they can't quite convey all the, the things that y'all can express here. So we appreciate it. Um, this takes a village, and I just want to thank the people that make this show happen. Uh, some people think I just show up and it happens. Uh, not at all. We've got, uh, number one, uh, the audience here is, is important. Uh, it's, it's much more enjoyable when we've got people here that we can interact with. And uh, I hope that you all get a lot out of it and have time afterward to uh, ask maybe some personal questions you've got. The uh, Columbia State has been, you know, a host that uh, 
Uh, they're like none other. We appreciate Mary Beth and Dr. Lampley and Bob and, and all the other crew here that uh, make it possible for us to get this job done. Creed Henderson and his staff at WCTV make us look good on TV. Uh, replays this show several times throughout the week. So if you've got Channel 3, if you've got Comcast Cable, you can watch it. Or uh, I've actually learned how to stream on YouTube now, Creed. So uh, you can actually uh, go to YouTube and find this show on YouTube. And I know how to find it now. So uh, that's a new thing. Uh, Tom Lawrence, uh, WAKM, has been very generous to make sure we get this out on the, the local radio. And I know a lot of people listen to it there because I get feedback from it. And we appreciate the uh, Weebs and Harold, um, Derby Jones and Cassie and their crew for helping us get the word out about these efforts and then covering the, the uh, results. Uh, the line leadership group, uh, oh, well, golly, Terry, uh, make sure we got the coffee. Thank you. Uh, it's a better deal than, than McDonald's coffee because it's free, folks. And uh, she's the lady back in the uh, lime colored, isn't that lime green you've got on back in the back. Uh, give her a hug and uh, thank her for that coffee we had this morning. Financial support from Vanderbilt University. Lynn Maddox is our contact there. And with AT&T, we haven't, uh, I haven't heard who our new uh, liaison there is, but uh, they've always been kind to help support this effort. And of course, the Williamson Inc. staff, uh, Matt, Kel, uh, Jenna Potter is our uh, lead uh, person today, and uh, it went smoothly. Jenna, thank you very much. Next show, uh, I think, is scheduled for May 31st. We will have Sam Whitson and uh, someone else whose name uh, I can't remember. Uh, uh, it's another retired representative, Darren Jernigan, from uh, the uh, Donaldson area of Nashville. We have worked together. Uh, on years for disability legislation. We're going to learn a lot from these guys about how uh, how they make sausage down there. And uh, uh, now that they have uh, no uh, elections to run for anymore, they can say it like they like they see it, and we look forward to that. Hope you'll all be back with us next next month. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>